dietitian. I'm an IBS dietitian and um, my practice is joint nutrition consulting. You will see me on Instagram as ibs.dietitian and my team is called team IBS dietitian. All right, let's get started. So let's talk about what is constipation, right? Oftentimes we think constipation, the older guidelines will suggest the symptoms of constipation include fewer than three bowel movements a day, a, a week, stool are hard, dry, lumpy, stool are difficult or painful to pass, so you have to strain, and the feeling that not all stool has passed. And um, ACG's um, American College of Gastroenterology, they have a new guideline on chronic idiopathic constipation, and their updated symptom is symptoms of constipation is associated with symptoms such as infrequent and incomplete defecation. And this is more or less what we normally see is incomplete defecation. Because sometimes people can have more than three bowel movements a day, but if their bowel movement looks like type one, type two, or even type three, it most likely is not a complete evacuation. And when we do, when they don't have complete defecation, the stool will build up in the colon, and that can cause symptoms. And then that can that is what we call constipation. <clears throat> All right, let me keep moving. And um, in June 2023, American College of Gastroenterology published its clinical practice guideline, pharmacological management of chronic idiopathic constipation. So this is chronic idiopathic constipation is very common in the United States. About eight to 12% of US population has it. And this is a lower GI tract disorder of gut brain interaction. And this is associated again with symptoms such as infrequent and incomplete defecation. And there should be absent, there should not be mucosa or structural abnormalities. All right, so medical cost on treating this condition is um, estimated at around $2,000 to $7,500 per patient per year, which can be a huge medical burden. And the impact on a patient's quality of life is similar to those with COPD, diabetes, and depression. So it has a huge impact on the patient's quality of life. Now, when it comes to constipation, the first thing we want to assess a patient on, um, there are many factors that affect chronic constipation, but then there are sometimes things that we don't think about that we should really um, consider before other intervention is looking at medication and dietary supplements that a patient may be taking that can cause them to have constipation. And here is a list of things. Most of these are medications. And then there's also supplements. Iron supplements do tend to cause more constipation. It can irritate the colon as well. And then, of course, the newer medication that everybody is raving about, the GLP-1, um, like uh, such as Ozempic, and we know they tend to slow gut motility down. So these are all things we want to look at when we are working with our patients, making sure that they're not taking anything in the list here and talk to their doctor, form a team, talk to their healthcare team to see if there are ways to adjust their medication to help improve their gut motility. <clears throat> now let's, let's dive into the guidelines that just came out this year. Now, this guideline is more focused on pharmacological agents in managing CIC, but in the guideline, the initial steps are increased fluid, increased fiber, and also behavior change. And in this presentation, I'm really going to focus on these steps that can help us. But to better understand their guidelines, we also want to look at what else is in there, the pharmacological management. So what they have is fiber, osmotic laxative, stimulant laxative, and then there are medications that helps. <clears throat> Sorry. So I'll talk more about this later, but then they, these are their initial steps before using medications. So, but um, their first, actually their first recommendation is fiber. I'm going to share more about fiber in a little bit because I want to get the pharmacological agents out of the way first. These are so osmotic laxative are the second recommendations from ACG's guidelines. And it is a great tool for people with chronic constipation because what osmotic laxative does is it draws fluids 
into the colon to soften the stool and help stool come out easier and faster. And you can see Miralax is the top here, and that is PEG, P-E-G. The recommended starting dose is 17 gram daily. And um, the side effects can include bloating, abdominal discomfort, and cramping. And there's no clear maximum dose, but you can start your patient on one dose daily. And it is very low cost, estimated 10 to $45 per month. And response to PAC has been shown to be durable for over six months. So this is great first line recommendation. And you will see most doctors will recommend Miralax as first line after fiber. All right, and then there's magnesium oxide, lactulose, and you can kind of see the initial starting dose in here, and also their cost. <clears throat> the side effects are similar to Miralax, but Miralax is very safe, whereas magnesium, we have to be careful if a patient has renal insufficiency or if they're pregnant, then that would not be something we recommend, and we always recommend them to talk to their healthcare provider first before trialing magnesium. Um, and lactulose, again, is very safe, and it is the only osmotic agent studied in pregnancy. Okay, and then there are stimulant laxative that are recommended as well in here, Doculax and Senna. So both of these are stimulant laxative, and what they do is they stimulate our gut muscle to improve gut motility, for the gut muscle to contract and help stool pass. They are also very affordable, and then the starting dose is listed here. All right, let's keep moving. And then there are prescription medications that you will often hear from doctors or from your patients that they are taking or trialing when it comes to managing um, chronic constipation. I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can see they can be very expensive for patients. These are per month cost <clears throat> and now let's go back now that we're done with the pharmacological agents let's go back to talk about a holistic approach so the acg's first recommendations is actually fiber and then they looked at about six studies and three different types of fiber to give a recommendation and what they recommend is that psyllium has more evidence but they also only looked at one study with brand, two studies with Inuland and with psyllium. They looked at three RTC studies that were from 1986 to 1995. So they are a little bit older, but their first line of recommendation is actually psyllium and trial psyllium. And you can see here, they also recommend what Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics recommends, which is about 14 grams of fiber. Oops per 1,000 calorie intake. And the total daily fiber intake recommended from diets and supplements would be around 20 to 35 grams daily. Okay, <laughs> so this is what their recommendation when it comes to fiber. And in additional comments here, which is very important, is ensure adequate hydration as fiber intake increases. And then there's no clear evidence that soluble and insoluble fiber is more effective. I'm going to dive a little, little bit deeper into this topic later because there is a difference and we can trial different types of fiber with different patients and determine what works best for individual patients. All right, and again, here is ACG's recommendation. So their suggestion on fiber supplement, they suggest fiber supplements over management without fiber supplements. And the first step is dietary assessment to determine intake from diet and supplement. So we want to see where our patients are when it comes to dietary fiber and supplements fiber intake. Are they in the ballpark of 20 to 30 grams per day? And then what they recommend is fiber supplements can be used as first line therapy for CIC, particularly for individuals with low dietary fiber intake. Okay, and then among the fiber supplements that they looked at, which is only from six studies, they found that only psyllium, only psyllium appears to be effective. And then they had very limited and uncertain data on bran and inulin because they only looked at three studies. But what they stress here is adequate hydration should be encouraged with the use of fiber. And we know that because if you're not hydrated enough, it will be difficult for stool to pass period. All right, I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit too. 
Now, fluctuance, yes, is a common observed side effect with the use of fiber. In their paper, though, their certainty of evidence for recommending fiber is actually low, even though fiber is their first line of recommendation. And I think it's more so because they only included six studies in the recommendation. And I'm going to share with you another study that looked at more, um, another systematic review that looked at more fiber and what their recommendations are. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so in 20, I think this was published in 2021 or maybe 2022. So Dr. Satish Rao and Dr. Baron, um, Darren Brenner created a systematic review of OTC therapies for chronic constipation, and they reviewed 1,297 studies and included 41 in their uh, systemic review. And again, in here, you can see um, over-the-counter laxative, osmotic laxative, PAC, Miralax, and also stimulant laxative, Senna, received grade A of recommendation. So this is the highest recommendation when it comes to chronic constipation management. And then the other laxative that we kind of talked about earlier are also included in this study. So this is what they recommended in, um, in previous recommendations in 2004. And this is the newer updated recommendation. So the change is Senna has now been, uh, is now a grade A level recommendation instead of a C. And then the other laxative and also magnesium has also improved from a C to a B. But start with Miralax or Senna. These are very safe. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> In this systemic review, systematic review, they also looked at a lot of fiber, a lot more than the previous um, ACG guidelines. And we want to see what really works and why we make such recommendations, right? So here are some of the products they look at. Basically, a lot of fruit-based laxative and food with prebiotics fiber it looked at kiwi fiber, mango, ficus, prunes, and then um, a rye bread with yogurt, and then these uh, yogurts with galacto oligosaccharide. So GOS, prunes, and linseed oil. So all of these have a B-grade recommendation. And you can see here, it's with the soluble fiber, they have psyllium here with a B-grade recommendation. So again, psyllium is recommended in this systematic review. And this is a good complement to the ACG guideline when we are making any recommendations for our patients because they reviewed a lot more fibers in here. And also, <clears throat> and also it can help us better support our patients when recommending different types of fiber supplements. Okay, let's talk more when it comes to dietary intervention, and that is including fiber. The um, ACG's guidelines also say recommendation of fiber is conditional, and the condition depends on how much fiber a patient is already take, intaking or eating at the time. And dietary assessment is extremely important to determine total fiber intake from diet and from supplements. Now, according to Anne Haynes records from the past 10 years and from the 2020 American Dietary Guidelines, over 90% of Americans don't consume enough fiber. I'm going to talk more about this later. So dietary assessment of fiber is really important. Okay, and there are multiple ways for you to do the 24 hour dietary recall. In my practice, what we do is we have a form for patients to fill out to share with us what their 24 day looks like when it comes to food intake, exercise and fluid intake. They fill it out as best as they can. And then we also do another 24 hour recall when we have our initial assessment or initial consultation with our client. And I will share this not to shame clients, but we all have our ideal day of how our day usually run like. We eat breakfast, we eat lunch, we may have a snack, we have dinner, and then this and that, and then we go to bed. But in reality, the ideal day does not happen very often. So if you're doing dietary, so when, what we see is what people write down is usually not what they did the previous day. Because when we are doing our intake, we really do a very detailed 24-hour intake from the previous day. A lot of what we hear is 
um, yesterday was not my normal day. Normal days don't always happen. It may happen once a week and patients think that that is their norm, when in reality, normal is probably more all over the place. Now, there are some people where they just have really structured, very fixed structural, structured stay. That happens, but it's not very common. So doing your fiber assessment, dietary assessment, 24 hour dietary recall is extremely important to understand what a true day looks like for your patients. <coughs> now, my recommendations for dietitian is we can leverage fiber supplements, but what we really want to do is start with improving diet quality by increasing fiber intake and variety, which we always know and we always say eat the rainbow and which is why this is so important um, i'm going to talk more about why this is important and um and fluid intake is really important as well and when we do our dietary recall always ask about fluids when are you drinking water how much water are you drinking did you finish the cup with your meal these are all things that can really help us understand a person's diet and their hydration status now let's dive a little bit deeper into fiber. So what we, uh, what I recommend usually with dietary fiber goal is, especially for the population with chronic constipation is about 25 to 38 grams of fiber per day. But that depends on the patients, right? It depends on their gender. It depends on their size and it depends on their um, caloric intake. But this is a good ballpark to start working, um, to start to work with your patients with. Now, we should also talk about fiber properties as well when we are talking about fiber supplements, because there are many supplements on the market and we need to figure out something that works for your patients. So the first question is, is the fiber soluble, right? The solubility, do the fiber particles dissolve in water? Now, soluble fiber helps um, <clears throat> in one way, but insoluble fiber actually improves gut motility and also reduce transit time. And you can see here, if something is not soluble, it actually helps improve relaxation and regulation. <clears throat> and this is a study that came out in 2022 from the British uh, Medical Journal that dive into fiber and their recommendation, I'll share with you their recommendation in the next page. But first, we really need to understand fiber properties, right? So solubility. And then the next thing we want to ask is, is, um, is the fiber gel forming? So the viscosity of the fiber, does it form gel when it is hydrolyzed? So if it's soluble, then the next question is the viscosity. So if it's gel forming, then it bulks up and helps improve um, stool bulking. And that can help stool comes out faster as well. And, um, and then the next question is, is the fiber fermentable? So um, psyllium is here. Psyllium is the only fiber that is not fermentable. And this can be the reason why we recommend psyllium first, because it's soluble and it's gel forming and it's not fermentable. So it don't cause more excessive gas when it's not fermentable. And it may be why it is the first line of recommendation and better suited for resolving constipation at first. But we can trial other types of fiber as well because psyllium is, um, sometimes patients just don't tolerate psyllium and that's okay as well. But we do want to, again, focus on improving diet quality. When we eat food, right, we eat fruits or vegetable, we are getting all different types of fiber in our diet. When we take a fiber supplements, we are getting single property fiber um, to improve gut function. And let's talk more about that next. So the article from British Medical Journal, this was actually published in 2022. And the title is Fiber Intake for Optimal Health. How can healthcare professionals support people to reach dietary recommendation? So, <clears throat> What they also point out too, and we all know that is appropriate fiber intake can decrease risk of inflammatory bowel disease, it can decrease risk of colorectal cancer, and a lot of other conditions as well that are not GI related to. And uh, with respect to disease prevention, the first line of defense is really encourage people to meet their dietary intake, meet um, 
variety of food and getting enough fiber in from their diet instead of supplements because when we are getting in from the diet we are getting the fiber in from the diet it we get a lot more variety of fiber and the fiber helps few different um, gut microbes different groups of gut microbes and that really improves the health of our gut and improve um, our immune homostasis and also improve functional barrier because the different types of fiber feeds different groups of gut microbes and that improves our gut microbiota composition and that improves the health of our gut. All right. Um, okay, so which is why again, we want to focus on improving diet quality instead of just recommending fiber supplements and and now fiber supplement can be extremely helpful for some because changing diet is hard but that's where we want to start with is improving diet quality and research and the american gut project suggested that eating 30 different types of plant-based food per week is what is optimal for our gut microbiota and i want to share more data with you on the gap we have here in the United States. So this is from the Dietary Guidelines of America in 2020 that was published in 2020. And this is the Dietary Guideline for 2020 to 2025. And what they have here is they published the results that uh, N. Haynes collected from the past 10 years. And you can see here, um, more than 90% of Americans do not meet their fiber goal, actually. More than 90% of women don't meet our fiber goal and more than 97% of men don't meet our fiber intake. And in the reports, they break it down into different age groups. So age 19 to 30, you can see the blue color here, the teal blue color here, they are the recommended intake range. And then the purple color here is the average intake for this group. And for vegetables, we are not hitting any of the intake ranges, recommended intake ranges here. And then for the older group, well, not older, <clears throat> for the 31 to 59 age group, we are again, most of the items, we're just not hitting the recommended intake for the food groups that we need to be eating. And then here is a chart for grains. So we are eating enough grains, but most of our grain intake comes from refined grains. And that is the same again for both age group. All right, and there's a lot we can do in terms of improving diet quality. And the first will be providing strategies on how to increase intake of these foods are the crucial first steps. Now we all know changing dietary habits is hard. So we really want to start from the basics and that is planning grocery shopping, making the food available at where the patients will be eating. So if they're buying all this food and storing in the fridge at home, but they don't bring the food to their workplace, then it's not available for them. So we really want to break down the steps and help our patients work on those step by step to get to a better place. And again, improving diet quality is extremely challenging. And this is where dietitians are trained for and why it is important to incorporate a dietitian in your care team to provide better care when it comes to GI nutrition. All right, now that we've finished talking about fiber, let's talk about fluids. Fluid is important, right? One of the colon's function is actually to reabsorb water to form stool. And if we are dehydrated, the colon will reabsorb more water and that will make our stool harder and more difficult to pass. So in a sense, Increasing fluid intake should take priority before increasing fiber because fiber draws water into the colon to the ones that are soluble and the ones that are gel forming right. They will draw water to make the stool softer, but if we don't have enough water in our system, our body will prioritize reabsorbing the water from the stool because we are dehydrated and we need the fluids for um, our bodily function in every single part of our body. Okay, and again, assess fluid intake using the 24 hour dietary recall and make sure we are asking those hard questions. People will say they bring a water, big water bottle with them everywhere, but if they're not finishing the water bottle, they're not drinking the fluids. So ask those detailed questions, understand your patients as much as you can 
this is where we can really make a difference. <clears throat> Okay, once we know their fluid intake, then we can make appropriate recommendation. So here is some um, two calculations that I use to calculate a baseline daily need, depending on the person's body weight. An example here, um, so you can take the body weight in pounds divided by two, and then translate that into a fluid ounce per day. Or if you use kilogram, then you can use 70 kilogram and then times by 30 to 35 milliliter. And then that would equal the total milliliter that they need per day. So calculate the baseline with your patients and decide how your patients can achieve the baseline. Now, whether they need more than the baseline will depend on how much exercise they do or whether how much they sweat. You know, these are again questions you want to be asking when you do the 24 hour dietary recall, assess their activity level as well so that you know if they need more fluids or not. And again, this is a baseline calculation. This is a starting point with your patients. This is not the end point. Individualize your approach and make a step-by-step -step recommendations for your patients. If they need to buy a water bottle first, then that will be your first recommendation. And what I find in my practice is people will likely meet their baseline fluid need if they have a bigger water bottle and if they are carrying the big water bottle with them everywhere they go. So maybe steps. <clears throat> All right, so the next dietary intervention I wanna talk about is meal and meal timing. So meal timing is extremely important for chronic constipated patients because of gastrocolic reflux. So the gastrocolic reflux is a physiological reflux that controls the motility of the lower GI tract following a meal. So when the stomach is stretched out because of food, because of ingestion, it increase motility in the colon. So when you eat food, food gets into the stomach, the stomach stretch out and the stomach sends a signal to the colon say, hey, we've got food coming, get things moving, make room. All right, so that's gastrocolic reflux. And gastrocolic reflux and our colon activities is actually the strongest in the morning. So number one recommendation for anyone who is constipated is please do not skip breakfast. Don't fast through the morning. Eat food, drink your fluids, and make sure your breakfast has a good volume to it. All right, and coffee can be extremely helpful as a laxative agent as well. So in the morning, have a good breakfast with volume, have some liquids because we usually wake up dehydrated overnight and then also have some coffee to help stimulate a better gastrocolic reflex for full evacuation so better defecation. <coughs> now, because of gastrocolic reflex, we really want to think about spacing meals out for patients with chronic constipation and recommending them to have three good meals a day. They can have snacks in between too, but the snacks should not take away the better meals, the bigger volume meals throughout the day. So three good meals in a day. Focus on getting in a volume and the volume could be coming from the fiber that we are helping them get more of, right? We all know my plate, half a plate of fruits and vegetables, and that's what we are aiming for. And one word of caution, right? If people are eating salads, leafy greens from salads do not contain a lot of fiber. One cup of leafy green is only one gram of fiber. So we would need to eat 20 to 30 cups of leafy green to meet that goal of um, our fiber goal. So if a patient is only eating salads, then help them add more varieties in their meals that can give them more fiber. Okay, so that's about meals. And then one thing I wanna kind of talk about because I'm talking about breakfast in here is um, make dedicated time in the morning to use the bathroom. And what we like to call in our practice is the protected potty time. Because again, gastrocolic reflux is the strongest in the morning. And if we are rushing, if we are trying to get to places, we are stressed out, our urge may not happen. So we want to really set aside maybe 10 to 15 minutes or even 20 minutes, depending on the patient, to use the bathroom, to know that that is the time that they can relax and go to the bathroom. <clears throat> All right, 
And then last but not least, because we're talking about meal timing and volume here is assess for underlying eating disorder. Chronic under eating can slow gut motility. And we really want to make sure that is not the case. If your patients have an active eating disorder, they need to work on their relationship with food first before working on gut health things that um, work on improving our relationship with food, work on the eating disorder first before working on these because some of the recommendations we have here can make their eating disorder worse. All right. <clears throat> so always assess underlying eating disorder. All right, so I mentioned coffee earlier with breakfast. Coffee is great because we know coffee. Well, most of us dietitians here, we know coffee has a lot of good qualities and it can help prevent a lot of other chronic conditions. And they have a few components that can maybe stimulate a better bowel movement. One is chlorogenic acid, and that is a phenolic acid found in coffee and it stimulates colon muscle contractions. Now, some newer studies suggest that it can lower inflammation, improve intestinal barrier function, and maybe even preserving cell membrane. And with these studies coming out, my guess is there will be supplements coming out very soon, or maybe they're already on the market. We know we can get this from coffee, and it's probably safest to get it from coffee because we know most supplements on the market are not regulated, and most of them are not third-party testers. So, but coffee does contain chlorogenic acid, and that can be very helpful. And coffee also contains caffeine that can stimulate a colon muscle contraction as well that can help us to have a better evacuation. And then coffee is usually a warm liquid. Some people like to drink it cold, but that's okay because the fluid adds bulk to the stomach. Again, that can stimulate a stronger gastrocolic reflex and help us have better defecation. All right. Word of caution on coffee though, some patients may have reflux. Um, in these cases, you can try a lower acid version of the coffee. There are a lot of um, coffee that have a lower acidities nowadays. So that's something you can try if a patient has reflux. And another caution is caffeine late in the day can interfere with sleep. I'm gonna talk about sleep later, but we really want to have better sleep quality and enough sleep to have better gut motility and better gut function. So if a patient is sensitive, we can recommend them to stop caffeine earlier on in the day. Usually my recommendation is cut off either 12 p.m. or 3 p.m. or even earlier if a patient is more sensitive. But if you drink coffee with breakfast, that's usually safe. <clears throat> All right, alcohol. Alcohol is interesting. So most of the studies on alcohol and gut motility has been focused on upper GI tract. So not a whole lot of studies that were done on the lower GI tract, but there were some studies that suggest that alcohol consumption can lead to constipation due to dehydration and slowing of intestinal emptying. Now that's um, occasional alcohol consumption, but chronic alcohol intake may cause an overgrowth of bacteria. And research for long-term alcohol use suggests diarrhea is more common. And that may be because of the bacteria overgrowth in the wrong parts of the GI tract. Now, when we are talking about alcohol, I always want to share about this statement. Alcohol is a toxic, psychoactive, and dependence-producing substance that has been classified as a Group 1 carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on cancer decades ago. And this is the highest risk group, which also includes asbestos, radiation, and tobacco. And this is a statement from WHO on alcohol. So whenever we talk about alcohol, we always want to talk about its toxic and inflammatory effect on the gut. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna move on to lifestyle intervention. So what um, one of the first line of recommendation from ACG's guideline, again, is fiber, fluids, and also lifestyle, exercise, right? But when we talk about exercise, we really, again, want to talk about hydration, hydration, hydration. When we exercise, we sweat more, so patients will need more fluids to make up to it. And one recommendation is don't go into an exercise dehydrated, so really encourage fluid intake before, during, and after exercise. 
And then high, uh, the intensity of exercise can also affect gut motility as well. We know that high intensity exercise can actually lead to more constipation. Well, one, maybe because we're sweating a little bit more and people are not rehydrating as fast as they could or they're not hydrated from the get go. And two, when we are doing high intensity exercise, it actually draws water out of our digestive tract to go to our extremities, our arms, our legs. And the decrease in blood flow in our intestinal tract can lead to one more inflammation and two, slower motility. All right. So what I usually recommend for patients who are already experiencing gut symptoms, right, do moderate intensity exercise. And these are the exercises such as walking, cycling, or any kind of or yoga, any kind of exercise where you will be breathing a bit more deeply, and then you can still form proper sentences without breaking up because you're huffing and puffing. So moderate intensity exercise can actually improve motility. It can decrease stress as well. So that's what I usually recommend. And then of course, movement that has an up and down motion can also help stimulate a bowel movement. In regards to exercise, right? Personalized approach is always the best practice. So learn more about your patients, what works for them and make recommendations accordingly and make sure they are well hydrated when they are exercising. Okay, sleep. So we kind of talked a little bit about sleep earlier when we talked about caffeine and we don't want to be drinking or eating foods with a lot of caffeine later on in the day because it can interfere with our sleep quality. <coughs> Some people may tell us, I can still fall asleep even if I drink a cup of coffee before I go to bed. Yes, they might be able to fall asleep, but the sleep quality would be affected. And we really are looking at enough sleep. So seven to nine hours of sleep and good quality sleep when it comes to improving gut function and improving gut motility. So sleep, not getting enough sleep can affect our stress level and stress can affect our gut motility. All right, and there are studies that looked at sleep and they found that people who don't sleep enough actually have a um, less diverse gut microbiota. So their gut microbiome has less diversity, which is quite interesting. And uh, we don't fully understand why this happens, but we know sleep has an effect on our gut microbiome diversity. Now, when it comes to sleep, right, if your patient is suggesting they have sleep issues, they have difficulty falling asleep, or they may be snoring, or if they have um, obstructive sleep apnea or other sleep disorders, we want to refer out or we want to let their physician know that this might be an area that they need to look into to help them improve sleep. They could get a consult with an ENT doctor to get um, sleep study done or even have their airway evaluation done. And then there are sleep specialists out there that sleep um, that studies sleep medicine and we can refer our patients to these practitioners to help them understand better on how to improve their sleep quality. <clears throat> All right, and then another lifestyle intervention that I want to talk about is pooping position and then pelvic floor issues so. Um, I didn't know this, but there is a name for devices like the toilet stool, and this is an um, image from Squatty Potty, which we all love because they are affordable and they really help improve defecation. So this is called defecation posture modification device. What a fancy name. So these devices positively influence bowel movement duration, straining patterns, and complete evacuation of bowels and um, studies that I have quoted here. I think, um, <clears throat> so you can see here, it the angle really matters. So squatting while having a bowel movement changes the anorectal angle and may allow for easier defecation. Um, <clears throat> now, some patients may have pelvic floor issues and actually up to half of the chronic constipated patients may have a pelvic floor issue. And in those cases, if diet changes and lifestyle changes are not enough, we want to refer our patients to see a pelvic floor specialist, pelvic floor physical therapist for an assessment, for evaluation. And then there are other tools that they can do and exercise that patients can do to help with better defecations. All right. <clears throat> okay, another thing we want to talk about because 
again, with chronic constipation, right, what we see is it affects female more than it affects male. And our menstruation cycle and our hormones may be one of the reasons why. Okay, so this is a normal monthly menstruation cycle. And we can see that this is body temperature, here are some hormones, and then here is estrogen, and here is progesterone. So progesterone is the hormone that helps us carry through a pregnancy. It is also a hormone that increases after ovulation before our period starts. So there is a good one to two weeks time where our progesterone is at a higher level before our period starts. And progesterone actually slows gut motility, which is why a lot of women have constipation when they are pregnant. Yes, the fetal position can be pushing on our colon, but our hormone plays a role into that as well. So every month when our progesterone increases, this can lead to more constipation. And for a lot of us, this can then lead to chronic constipation if we don't address the constipation. So what I usually recommend in cases like this is really start tracking our menstruation patterns and see if it correlates to what we are seeing here, if the patients have more constipation during the PMS time. And then sometimes patients will tell you when my periods start, I get period poop, and that is diarrhea during their periods. And it's very common as well because there is another hormone, it's called prostaglandin, that is produced when we have our periods, and that is the hormone that helps shed our uterine lining. And um, that hormone can get to other organs in the abdominal area because it all of the organs, right? The colon, the uterus, they're all very close together. When prostaglandin, that hormone gets into our colon, it can cause our colon to have more contractions and hence why people may get diarrhea when they are on their periods. Now, we wanna go back to talk about constipation. If we see a pattern with a patient when they have, um, after their ovulation, before their periods, they're more likely to be constipated there are tools we can do to help them resolve the constipation or help them maybe at least understand their body a little bit more. And then the tools here includes again, over-the-counter laxative, right? That would be your osmotic laxative, senna, magnesium. And then one thing we always wanna think about too is increasing fiber intake, increase your fruits and vegetable intake, and then also increase fluid intake. And for those of us who are women, we know these periods of time, we tend to be more stressed. Focus on stress management strategy with your patients as well and, and maybe help them find some self-care exercises that can be more helpful during this time to bring their stress level down. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk more about that next. Okay, so constipation is the most common kind of functional gut disorder. And when we talk about fun functional gut disorder, we have to talk about the gut-brain axis. Um, and the gut brain axis really refers to the communication between the brain and the gut. So the different there are many things that can play a part into this communication, as you can see here. But in this presentation, I want to focus on more of the practical tools that you can use to help your patients improve the gut brain communication and the gut brain interaction here to decrease symptoms. Okay, lifestyle interventions. So. Our brain and our gut is actually um, connected by the vagus nerve. And you can see the vagus nerve also connects to our lungs, to our hearts, and to our liver. And um, when we talk about improving gut brain interaction, we are talking about stimulating the vagus nerve as well as doing other things um, about stress management. So, with stress management, we can help patients and recommend maybe some modification to their lifestyle to decrease stress. And that can be incorporating exercise. Practicing gratitude is one that I find to be very, very helpful. And then of course, meditation and also doing exercise such as yoga or um, even gardening or other things that, or going out into nature, like incorporating more things into their life that can help them bring down the stress level. Now, I was talking about the vagus nerve here and you can see all of the organs that the vagus nerve is connected to. So none of the organs we can control. The only thing we can control here is the lung, and which is why there are some what we call respiratory vagal activation techniques here where we can manipulate the movement of our lungs 
for better stimulations of the vagus nerve. And when we stimulate the vagus nerve, that actually helps us improve gut-brain interaction. And here are some of the techniques. So breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing is extremely helpful. Singing, humming, gargling water, these are all ways that we can stimulate our vagus nerve by activating our um, respiratory tract. Um, and then another thing that um, breathing here, it actually really helps with stress management as well. So this is one of the techniques that I recommend the most when it comes to improving gut brain interaction and improving gut function and improving gut motility. And it's so easy to do. Key is make it small steps for your patients to implement it into their day. Um, don't tell them to breathe for five minutes, tell them to breathe for one minute. The smaller the step, the more easier it is to be incorporated throughout the day and really help them. So something else to think about and making it more practical for your patients to use. <clears throat> now, there are other therapies that is um, that can help improve our gut brain function as well and can help improve um, stress management. So cognitive behavioral therapy is, of course, we all know is extremely helpful. We can refer patients out or we can let their physicians know that, hey, this is something we may want to consider with our patients here. And uh, we know not everybody have access to a therapist. There are electronic devices here that can help um, make it more accessible for patients. And Mahana is one of the brands that offers it. Prescription is needed, so communicate with your patients and communicate with their healthcare team as needed. And then there is also gut directed, gut directed hypnotherapy. So Nerva is the company that provides gut directed hypnotherapy. You can do it on your film. This is quite affordable and accessible for everyone. No need prescription for that. And um, it can be a good tool to use for your patients. Okay, the next topic I'm gonna move on to, we are probably going to run over time here, but the next topic, I just wanna give everybody a fair warning. We still have some materials to go through. Uh, hopefully I can wrap up in the next 10 minutes, but we will probably run a little bit over time. So food intolerance is one factor that we see a lot in um, IBS patients with chronic constipation. And um, the AGA, which is American Gastroenterological Association, updated their guideline this year on belching, bloating, and distension. <coughs> and this is one of the flowcharts that I find to be extremely helpful because when we look at constipated patients, right, they likely, some of them may have belching, some of them, they will probably all have bloating and distension. And before we investigate food intolerance, we do want to try to resolve the constipation first, which is all of the strategies we talked about earlier, right, using some laxative, using fiber, increasing fluids and gut brain therapies. And, and then if after using laxative, they're fully evacuated and they still have belching, bloating, or distension, then the next thing we want to investigate is food intolerance. And you can see here, the investigation includes carbohydrate intolerance, and that is FODMAPs, and then also celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and maybe food allergies. So these are things that we want to investigate. And what are the treatments? So the treatments are carbohydrate, investigate carbohydrate intolerance or FODMAP restrictions. Well, FODMAP protocol is not just restriction, right? It's a full protocol where people restrict, reintroduce and identify their triggers. And then their other recommendation is gluten-free diet for celiac disease or if suspected non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And I'm gonna talk about that next. And I'm gonna share a case study with you on non-celiac gluten sensitivity or what we like to call non-celiac wheat sensitivity. <clears throat> okay, so carbohydrates intolerance. Um, the first line of recommendation is probably low FODMAP diet, work through the full diet and see if a patient is intolerant to FODMAP and what group of FODMAPs they don't tolerate and their level of tolerance. Once you identified their group that they may not tolerate, then we can recommend other strategies to help them manage. And like FOTSIM is one enzyme.
Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully we can get Jesse back in a second. I'm not sure <laughs> um, what happened. Must be her Wi-Fi connection. Um, just looks like. Oh, Hi, I'm wait. back. I'm so wait. sorry. That's okay. No worries. <laughs> Feel okay. free to just throw your, your slides back up. Okay, let me jump back in. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. All right, so did you all hear, did I finish the part on carbohydrate intolerance and FODMAP intolerance, or did I get cuts before that? You got cut a little bit before you finished, I believe. Okay, so with FODMAP intolerance, right, as dietitians, what we need to do is help our patients get through the whole protocol. Elimination, reintroduction, and identify the food triggers. Once we identify what groups of carbohydrates they don't tolerate, then we can recommend things like FODSYME to help them break down those groups of FODMAPs. Now, FODSYME helps break down lactase, GOS, and fructan. So it can be really helpful to help our patients increase the food that they can eat without worrying so much about symptom using targeted tools, okay? <clears throat> now let's talk about gluten intolerance here. So gluten intolerance refers to people who have celiac disease, non-celiac wheat sensitivity, and gluten allergy. I didn't put that down here because I want to focus more on these two conditions. Now non-celiac gluten sensitivity or non-celiac wheat sensitivity is an immune mediated reaction to gluten or components of wheat. In some patients with self-reported non-celiac gluten sensitivity, fructan in gluten-rich foods, so fructan is a FODMAP, in gluten-rich foods rather than the gluten causes symptom. This is where it is very important for us to identify whether it is the fructan or other components of wheat or gluten that is causing the immune mediated reaction that patients would have. And I'm gonna share a case study with you very soon. And what we do in our practice is we recommend using sourdough for challenge purpose. So to identify non-celiac wheat sensitivity, we help a patient get to a completely gluten-free diet, and then we challenge it with sourdough bread. And the reason why we use sourdough is because, many of you should know, sourdough is low FODMAP. And sour, so sourdough don't have fructan or ATI um, in that. So ATI is another thing from wheat that could potentially trigger symptoms, which is why we use sourdough to make sure that they are actually reacting to gluten. There are other things on the market that you can use for challenging this. Um, I think Vito gluten protein can be another product to use, but sourdough is more available and it tastes better, in my opinion. <clears throat> so when we go through the challenge, when you go through the challenge, you help your patients identify if they are sensitive to gluten or not. All right. Okay, I'm gonna share with you one of the tools that we use a lot in our practice. <coughs> and that is assessing a patient's stool, right? Like what I said earlier in uh, the presentation, if a patient is telling you they are having multiple bowel movements, maybe every single day, they have three to four bowel movements, but every single one of their bowel movement looks like type one or type two, they are probably not having full evacuations and they are still constipated. So assessing their stool is extremely, extremely important to identifying if they are actually constipated or not. I can't tell you how many times or how many clients have told me, Jesse, I'm not constipated. I'm pooping every single day. But if their stool looks like this, or sometimes even the type threes, they probably may not be having full evacuations. All right. Okay, and I'm gonna share two case studies with you. One of them is a chronic idiopathic constipation. The patient here is a self-care provider. Oh, just a caution, I'm sorry, I did not say that before I get into this slide. I'm gonna share a lot of slides with bowel movement pictures on there. We are all healthcare providers. I trust that it doesn't gross you out because this is a good tool for us to use, but if it gross you out, you can maybe minimize the screen if you want to keep hearing what we are talking about here. <clears throat> All right, so case one, this patient is actually a healthcare provider herself, struggled with chronic constipation for over 20 years. She's had three prior surgeries related to chronic constipation, and a fissure, prolapse, and hemorrhoid. And this is what her bowel movement looks like when we started working together. And some days she would have multiple bowel movement that looks like these, and you can see, they're just small chunks of stool. So what we did with this client was 
we well one we use some laxative to help her really um, move the stool out of her gut and then she felt so much better after that and then we worked on increasing dietary fiber increasing fluid and incorporating exercise into her daily routine we also talked about stress management as well using deep diaphragmatic breathing and also abdominal um, massage one thing that we hear all the time from all of our patients who have chronic constipation is they hold a lot of when they're stressed they hold a lot of tension in their abdominal area and abdominal massage can really help break up that tension and it can help improve gut motility as well so after we incorporated all of these things with her this is what her bowel movement looks like and she had no vomit intolerance so <clears throat> a lot of the patients refer to our ways is they want to do the low vomit diet because their doctor told them to do it. So she did go through the FODMAP diet and FODMAP challenge as well. But once we resolved her chronic constipation using these methods, she had um, no FODMAP intolerance. She challenged all groups of FODMAPs and she tolerated all of them. Okay, so this is important to think about, which is why before you do an elimination diet with your patients, you know, help them have full evacuations first. Or after if they have full evacuations, they still have a lot of the symptoms then you move on to challenge the foods to understand food intolerance. So this is probably what a full evacuations would look like for a normal person who don't have chronic constipation. It's very different than what we see here. So if your patients are having droplets of stool or very small hard stools, then they are probably constipated. Okay, this is a little bit more gross, but this is a case study of someone with non-celiac wheat sensitivity. <clears throat> so this is a patient that was referred to me by her physician by her physician to do the low vomit diet and when she joins the program this is what her stool looks like and then when we started using some laxative this is what her stool looks like you can see that she started to have very small tiny little pablets of stool that are pointy on both ends and she's actually having more of a diarrhea than what we saw here more for evacuations when people use laxative and this is why you know we really investigated on her food intolerance so she also started the low format diet and she started eating oats and one of the comments she made to me is she never ate oats before she doesn't like oats but because of the low format diet she started eating a lot of oats and here are some of the other modalities that we worked on right we worked on fluids fiber exercise sleep and stress so this patient is already drinking enough fluids, already hitting her fiber goal. So she's very health conscious, but she just still has all of these gut issues that she's dealing with. She doesn't know what was going on. And she regularly exercises. I think the only thing we talked about is maybe reducing the high intensity exercise to more moderate intensity exercise because she does CrossFit training that can be too high intensity for someone with um, gut symptoms already. Her sleep was fine, but she was also stressed because she had a lot of gut symptoms, and that is going to be a common thing you see working with GI patients. So after using laxative, this is what happens. And when I saw this happening, instead of having better evacuations, she actually went into having diarrhea. Then that's when we looked at, okay, maybe she has a gluten intolerance. And because of her comment about oats, and I said to her, you know, how about we remove oats and gluten as well? So she started a gluten free diet. We really helped her start the gluten free diet. <clears throat> Sorry, let me go back here. After she started a gluten free diet and removed oats, this is how her bowel movement changed over time. Now, I want to say this here only necessary when we, we would recommend a gluten free diet because this is a really, really difficult diet. It's very hard on the patients physically and mentally. When we talk about the gluten-free diet, we're not just talking about removing bread, donuts, muffins, cake, whatever. We are talking about removing cross-contact. We're talking about removing cross-contamination as well. So it can be very hard. Only if it's necessary, should you recommend someone to try the gluten-free diet. But what I also want to point out is being able to see and analyze stool consistency is key to helping these patients identify their triggers. See how her stool changed after she got on the gluten-free and oats-free diet. This is like magic, you know, for those of us on my team, we are singing and dancing in the background when we see the transition. 
from my patients that went from constipation, diarrhea to better evacuation. So she's still taking Miralax at this point because it's not the Miralax that's giving her the diarrhea. It is really a food intolerance that's giving her symptoms and problem. <clears throat> all right, I wanna share with you something else that happens too is that we all know, like we just said, the gluten-free diet is extremely hot. And one day she had no food choices. She was with a friend at Panera and she ate a sandwich. And I want to show you the transition of her stool after that. So this is day one. Actually, before this happened, she stopped documenting the food she was eating until this happened. And then she was like, oh, I ate a sandwich. Let me just write it down here so Jesse can look at it and let me know what's going on. So day one looks fine. Day two, you know, still regular bowel movement, right? Not those droplets that we saw. Day three, what we are seeing here is constipation kind of coming back because she's not having full evacuations anymore. And then day four, the stool still looks fine. And then it got very, I don't even know how to describe it, but this is something you'll see a lot for patients with food intolerance. And then day five, the stool really broken up. And you can see here she wrote, um, she had junior mint before bed while making lunches. She started having gut symptoms and now she started documenting the food she's eating and frantically looking everywhere what that was, was contributing to her symptoms. And what it was, was actually the wheat bread that she ate, you know, five days ago. Um, and then this is the process that she went through, kind of went through and see how many days it took. Like stool continued to change consistency got worse and worse, have more gas, more explosive diarrhea, <clears throat> and, then, and then it improved starting on day 10, day 12, day 13, and day 14. It's finally looking more normal or more like baseline of her baseline. And, and this is what we usually see with non-celiac wheat sensitivity. And, but we really want our patients to test it out, to eliminate and challenge before we say, hey, this is probably something you're sensitive to and let's figure out, you know, how to proceed after that and help them adapt to a gluten free lifestyle after that. But we have to challenge the food before telling the patients to cut it all out because it's hard being gluten free. Okay. And, um, and that's the case study. And now let me just summarize real quick what we talked about. So First line of recommendation uh, when it comes to improving chronic constipation is improve diet, improve diet quality, improve fiber, make sure our patients are hitting their fiber goal, fluids, make sure they are hitting their own fiber goal, uh, fluids goal, make sure they're well hydrated, and then meal timing, eat a good breakfast, save time to go to the bathroom, don't rush. Okay, and then improve that brain connection, right? Manage stress, exercise, do some respiratory vehicle activation techniques. And if none of those work, then we really want to look at food intolerance, whether it is FODMAP or gluten related disorder. So here is, it concludes my presentation. And then here are all the references here. I know it's very small. I did um, reference a lot of research in here and then let's go into Q&A. Wow. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was truly fantastic. I learned a ton. I hope you all did too. Um, we have a ton of fantastic questions here. We'll get through a couple of these um, and then follow up with um, others that, that we don't get to. I'm going to go through and just kind of um, choose a kind of assortment of them. So we hit on a few different topics and try to um, go over what seems to be um, common themes in the questions. So the first one um, would be around kind of adjusting the um, water and hydration and fiber goals for anyone who's maybe in an overweight category or has a um, overweight BMI. Sorry, can you, hydration status if somebody is overweight? Adjusting the goals um, and any recommendations there. Hmm, I don't have a lot of recommendations because sometimes if a patient is have a higher weight, I don't like to use the word BMI because we know they are not as accurate. Um, if a person have a high weight and the fluids recommendation is way out of the ballpark, right? Like three, four or five liters of water per day, then we probably know that it's not what we would recommend and maybe staying with two to three liters per day will help your patients to maybe get to a higher level of, um, of the two to three liters and then see how they do, whether they need more or not. 
So it's a very personalized approach, but you don't have to go way overboard that people are peeing all day long. That's not our goal as well. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, here we have another few questions that are around the kind of timing of fiber supplements, um, when to take them, um, with a meal, without a meal, um, any recommendations you have there? Hmm. I usually recommend fiber in the morning because, again, gastrocolic reflex is the strongest in the morning, and we really want to stimulate a better evacuation, um, and that can help bulk up our meal in the morning. And we know breakfast is usually not the one that we eat most food on, and we usually may not be eating enough fiber in the morning as well, so that could be a good meal. And sometimes what I also like to recommend is smoothies that have vegetables and fruits in it. And patients can add more things like um, frozen fruits, avocado, or even chia seeds in there to help improve their fiber intake in the morning. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fiber supplement. We wanna think more food-based if it's doable for the patients. Now, it may not be doable, so depending on what the patient wants, but morning would be a better time. But sometimes, you know, again, it depends on the patient. If they tend to be really good with their fiber intake through the day, but some days they may not be hitting their fiber goal and at the end of the day, they realize they're not hitting their fiber goal or they realize they haven't eaten as much fruits and vegetables as intended, which it happens to all of us, right? Supplementing fiber at night can be helpful as well. So it really varies person to person. Um, start with the morning if necessary, but you can they can take it at night as well to um, make up for what they didn't eat in the day. Thank you. Great. Very helpful. Here we have a question from Jessica regarding the gastrocolic reflux. Um, she says, I often have clients with IBS who mistakenly ID foods as triggers for diarrhea because they have symptoms right after eating. What do you find helpful for these clients? And then she also falls, follows up with, can those symptoms be attributed to the reflux itself and not just the FODMAPs and or the stress? I mean, yes, it definitely can. If someone is already struggling with diarrhea, then sometimes the gastrocolor reflex is just making it worse, right? So, um, but if it depends on the type of diarrhea they have, we want to assess to see, you know, is it a malabsorption kind of diarrhea or do they have more gas production with the diarrhea? Then we want to see, do we want to do the FODMAP diet? I mean, we do see a lot of um, diarrhea patients tend to respond better to the low FODMAP diet compared to chronic constipated patients. Um, smaller meals will probably be recommended for someone who struggles with diarrhea so that we reduce the gastrocolor reflux reaction in these patients. Thank you, great. Here, we've also had a few different questions about um, partially hydrolyzed guar gum. I'm wondering if that came up in the research or if you have any kind of additional insights to share on that. Yeah, so it was in the fiber research is in, the, um, <clears throat> I think it's the soluble viscous group. So it's soluble in water, it forms gel, it is fermentable. So it does help with chronic constipated patients. And it is actually something we recommend routinely as well, because they are very gentle. Most people tolerate it very well, and it helps improve gut microbiome in some of the studies we've looked at. Now, ACG guideline did not incorporate that, and um, Dr. Rao's guideline recommendation also didn't incorporate PHGG in there, so I didn't kind of talk about this in this presentation, but it is one of the fiber that we recommend routinely, especially for people who have a more sensitive gut. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question we have about um, any recommendations for abdominal massage. Oh, yes. So the ILU massage is something I recommend the most. Now, any type of uh, <clears throat> abdominal massage is extremely helpful. Just like moving things around, breaking up that tension can release a lot of the stress and the tension in the gut. Because what you will hear, or maybe ourselves um, can understand as well, is when we are stressed, we hold our muscles. And for people with chronic constipation, we see that more often and they hold a lot of their abdominal wall muscle in their abs area. And when they do the massage, it really helps break up that tension so that it gives, um, it, it just helps stimulate things move a little bit better. We see that benefits diarrhea patients as well, especially when they're having diarrhea. So any type of abdominal massage can help. You can start with the ILU, but sometimes patients find the ILU I L U to be too annoying, then you can just tell them to move anywhere, like moving around their guts. That can be helpful. 
Great, thank you. Um, here we do have a question about um, sourdough. So asking not all sourdough is low FODMAP for the research, correct? So maybe some advice on identifying the right kind of sourdough to use <laughs> the trials mentioned. Yeah, so with sourdough, we definitely want to find something that is fermented overnight or at least proved for a good amount of hours um, for it to be low FODMAP. So if a patient can find something that is made in a local bakery, you know, they can ask about how long it's been fermented for, proved for, that helps in finding a sourdough that is lower in FODMAP and ATI as well. It's hard um, to have that kind of information if you go to a grocery store. But some of the brands do put it on their um, label. Not all brands do. So in these cases, go to a local bakery, ask them. Usually local bakeries have the better quality sourdough that they prove overnight. And of course, when we do the challenge, you know, we want people to enjoy the food they are eating. And if they do have a true intolerance, then it may be the last time they're eating sourdough bread. So find something that is better quality. And that's a great question. It's hard to tell. I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Great. Thank you. That's definitely helpful. Um, we do have so many more fantastic questions here. So we will collect these into a document um, and, you know, share them with you, Jesse, so that you can answer some and we can kind of aggregate them into maybe common themes and send those around to everyone here. Um, but for the yeah. sake of um, today, we, we will wrap up um, and end our um, session. As Megan mentioned, we'll be sharing a link to the recording. Um, please just give us a little bit of time with that. Um, so that email will include the, the recording as well as the live CEU certificate um, for anyone here with us today. And then we will be submitting the recorded webinar for approval for a CEU as well. And that usually um, takes a little bit of time. So it'll be pending approval um, for the next several weeks, but um, also hoping to offer a CEU certificate for that as well. Yes, yeah, and everyone, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Jesse, go ahead. There was a question that I just answered, and it's um, asking if the patient has celiac screening done when I presented about the non-celiac wheat sensitivity case. So yes, they do, because it is an IBS patient, so they've got celiac screening done. But I want to point out that celiac screening is not perfect, and sometimes it can take a long time for a person to get a celiac diagnosis. So in cases like these, we also want to encourage patients to maybe get tested again with their physician and actually teach them how much gluten they need to be eating prior to actually actual celiac testing. And that is two slices of bread or two servings of gluten every day for six to eight weeks prior to testing. So sorry, I just wanted to answer that oh. question there. That's a really good question. And everyone rest assured, I have copy and pasted all of these questions into a document <laughs> and we are going to hopefully get answers from Jesse on them. So don't worry, hold tight. Um, please be patient with her. It might take her a couple of days. We have about 40 questions, um, but I will make sure you all receive a copy of that. So Thank you all for joining and um, you, Jessie's information is on this slide so you can contact her with any additional questions. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye everyone.